Good morning, kids. Happy Friday, April 3rd. A very happy birthday to Everett, whose birthday is today. And a very happy birthday to TJ, whose birthday is tomorrow. Boys, I promise when we are all back together, your cakes will be at the top of the list of things that need to happen. Parents, just so you know, on Fridays we do things a little differently in class. I didn't do it last week so we could all kind of get in our groove, but we'll jump into that this week. We usually do a bigger project with a story, and then we go ahead and do some math games. So that's what we'll do today. And our story today kind of jumps off of what we're learning in nature studies. So those of you who follow the extra lessons, not required, but if you want them, they're there. We are learning about ecosystems and biomes. So the places where all the living things work together to stay alive in one environment. And this is a man, it's not particularly about a specific biome, but he loved to study creatures and how they all lived and what was unique about them. So this is called Small Wonders. It's about Jean-Henri Fabre and his world of insects. And the story is by Matthew Clark Smith and illustrated by Giuliano Ferry. Here we go. Once there was a village in the sunny south of France, a village much like any other, where the cocks crowed and the church bells rang and everyone seemed to know his or her place. Everyone, that is, but one. At the very edge of town, behind high walls and plane trees, there stood a pink house. In the house, there lived an old man with beetle black eyes and a black felt hat who talked to animals. Whether he was a sorcerer or simply a madman, no one could agree. On the hottest afternoons, he squatted in the sun watching beetles dig holes. On the darkest nights, he crouched in the bushes watching spiders build webs. He paid the village children to find dead moles and lizards for a penny apiece. Then he set them out in the garden to lure blue bottle flies. Inside the house, according to rumor, lurked even stranger things. Scorpions scuttling in cages, swallows darting through open windows, pickled sea creatures arriving in crates, and roasted caterpillars, one man swore it, for dinner. Over the years, the old man's reputation grew and grew, cocooned in mystery. And then, one bright fall day, when the old man was very old indeed, the villagers heard the strange chug, chug, chug of motor cars in the valley. The cars, sleek and black, rumbled up to the pink house in a swirl of dust. A figure stepped out, and then another figure with a familiar face. It was the president of France. The villagers whispered and stared. Who was this man, this mysterious neighbor, who spoke to presidents and beetles alike? His name was Jean-Henri Fabre. There are many paths to genius. Monsieur Fabre's had begun on the side of a mountain nearly a century before. Little Henri lived in an old gray farmhouse that was the only house for miles. In fact, it was the only anything for miles, other than the pigs and cows that trudged through the bogs, the potatoes that strained against the stony soil, and the gorse bushes that clung to the rocks. After dark, Henri fell asleep to the whipping of the wind and the howling of wolves. But where others might have seen a harsh gray world, a world of rocks and bogs, cow dung and rain, Henri saw a world of small wonders. Here was a sky blue jewel on the bottom of the leaf, or so it seemed. Here was a hen's egg in moss, round and white, yet soft as a pillow. Here was a tiny ram's horn carved in a stone. Here were diamonds and gold dust, treasures locked in the hollow of pebbles. Only later would he learn the real names of these things and repeat them to himself like magic charms. Hopley a beetle, Amanita mushroom, Ammonite fossil, quartz crystals and mica flakes. For now, they were nameless miracles. When Henri was seven years old, his family moved into town and he started school. Still, he found marvels everywhere. When his father sent him to mine the ducks at the pond, Henri came back soaking wet, his pockets sagging with treasures. While his classmates scribbled their lessons in Latin, Henri fiddled with wasp stingers and snapdragon pods hidden in the nooks of his desk. Mostly, he kept these things to himself. No one else seemed to understand. What good, demanded his teacher, could ever come of squinting out flower, squinting at flowers 
when there was Greek and arithmetic still to master. Henri's father moved the family from town to town, searching for a better life that seemed forever out of reach. By the time Henri turned 16, he decided to strike out on his own. He joined a railroad crew, sold lemons at the market, and lived sometimes on little more than grapes snatched from roadside vineyards. And yet, everywhere he looked, small wonders called to him. Every patch of dirt and tangle of weeds buzzed with insects. Dazzling beetles, ferocious wasps, sweet singing crickets, and more. At last, Henri found a job as a teacher, but the classroom was dark and clammy. He took his students outside, where they learned the songs of grasshoppers and drank honey from the clay nests of mason bees. However, Henri soon realized that now he had little time to study his beloved insects. For years, nothing seemed to come easy, except for one great happiness. He fell in love and married a young teacher named Marie, but their first two children died, and exhausted by grief, Henri felt his insects slipping away. Still, he pressed on with his studies, finally earning the highest degree possible. And then, one winter evening, Henri read an article that would rekindle his greatest passion. It told of a certain wasp, the Cerceris, that hunted beetles nearly twice its own size. Each mother wasp left a beetle in her burrow along with her eggs, a meal for her children to be. The beetle was dead, or so it seemed, yet however long it lay in that burrow, it stayed afresh. Had the wasp mastered the secret of preserving life beyond death? Henri had read books about insects before, but they were dull beyond measure. Now his curiosity caught fire all over again. What about the lives of these animals, lives full of drama and mystery? So he went out to stock the Cerceris. He dug up the wasp's burrows, gathered, gathered beetles by the hundreds, brought them home to poke and prod. He spent hours bent in the grass, watching the wasps hunt, and at last he arrived at an answer. The beetles weren't dead at all. They were simply paralyzed, made forever still by one well-aimed stab from the wasp's venom-tipped stinger. When the baby wasps hatched, they ate their giant meal alive. Henri's findings caused a stir among his fellow scientists. It was hard to say which was more startling, the discovery itself or the unknown outsider who had made it. Eager to share what he learned, Henri taught classes for anyone who was interested. But when the authorities found out what he was teaching, they were not pleased. The bloodthirsty exploits of ant warriors, the secret love life of plants, before he knew it, Henri was out of a job. The next few years were dark ones, and one harsh winter, Henri caught a fearsome case of pneumonia. Shivering in bed, he was struck by a dreadful thought. He was going to die. But he could not bear to go without saying goodbye to his beloved insects. He told his son of a colony of bees nearby, fast asleep in their winter nests. Soon the boy was back with a handful of bees, still as stones. He laid them on his father's bed. Just as Henri moved to touch them, he saw a sudden twitch, then another. The bees were stirring, brought to life by the heat of the fire. They fluttered their wings, stretched their legs, wiggled their antennae. Before long, they were buzzing at the windows. Henri's heart leapt at the sight. Here was a reason to live. The insects needed a champion, someone to reveal their secrets to the world. In the weeks and months that followed, Henri began to write like a man possessed. His words often flowed and danced like poems. He wrote of the great peacock, the bat-winged moth with what seemed like a sixth sense. Henri combed almond twigs for the moth's cocoons. He kept each cocoon in a jar until the moth emerged. If it was a female, a marvelous thing would happen. At night, called by some trace of a scent, male moths from miles around would be drawn to the female in the jar. He wrote of the processionary, that humble caterpillar that traveled in great caravans, End to end, day into night, Henri find he could place a line of caterpillars on the rim of a flower pot, connect the back of the line to a front, and watch the creatures march in circles for days. He wrote of the empusa, or devilkin, that strange and fierce-looking insect with its great spike-lined claws and its warrior's headdress. To his surprise, Henri found it a delicate creature, very choosy about its meals. And he wrote of the sisyphus, 
the tiny dung beetle with what seemed like a model marriage. Henri watched each pair as it rolled a ball of dung, precious food for its babies, back to the nest. The beetles might work for hours, the female pulling, the male pushing from behind. Henri wrote about dozens of other insects as well, each with its own fascinating story to tell. And as the years passed, word slowly spread of this curious hermit with the golden pen. Eventually, Henri had enough money to fulfill his oldest dream. He and his family found a tiny village with a pink house tucked away behind high walls and plane trees that seemed just right. It was here that he set about building his insects paradise. As Henri worked, the seasons passed. Each season and each year brought new marvels. But did others see these things, really see them as he did? This is what Henri asked himself as he neared his 90th year. Looking back on his difficult life, he saw it as a small flower coaxed from stony soil. If his books had let even the tiniest spark of wonder in one reader's heart, he thought, then perhaps he had been of some use. It was then that the news came. The leading scientists in France had gathered to nominate one of their own for a tremendous honor. The vote had been unanimous. Jean-Henri Fabre, the insects poet, was to be put forward for a Nobel Prize. Now, thought the committee, where can we find this man, this hidden treasure? And so it was that the farmers of the little village of Serignan turned from their fields to discover a once-in-a-lifetime sight. The president of France's gleaming motorcade roaring down their dusty street. One by one, the villagers dropped what they were doing. They ran toward the pink house. Just in time to see their madman, their sorcerer, receiving his guest like a king. We have all of us, men and animals, some special gift. One child takes to music, another is quick with figures. It is the same way with insects. One kind of bee can cut leaves, another builds clay houses. In human beings, we call the special gift genius. In an insect, we call it instinct. Instinct is the animal's genius. So I hope that you can see from that story that this man never gave up learning and he always wanted to know how these creatures lived and worked together and what made them all special. And I love that quote at the end that's from him where he says, all of us are good at something. All of us have something special about us and the insects, we call it instinct, but God has given each of them these special gifts that make them unique. All right, you can turn on the next video to see our project for today.